Hello, and welcome to this mid-June edition of Travel Talk Live. My name is Mary Crawford, and I'll be your moderator for today. Barbara Long will field your questions, which you can post in the chat. And Adair Huchin is our speaker, here to talk to us about native plants. Adair joined Master Gardener as a trainee in September of 2019, and since then has been learning about native plants and pollinators, gradually converting her garden to more native plants and recently discovering which trees, shrubs and perennials are the most important for our pollinators and wildlife. Adair's message is that each of us can contribute to the well being of our pollinators by planting and protecting these so called keystone plants. Welcome, Adair. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mary. I really appreciate it. And um, I'd like to start with um, the way my mind works is in rhyme with a, a silly poem that I, I wrote. Uh, if you plant it, they will come from. Uh, a the Field of Dreams movie misquote, which was, if you build it, they will come. In this case, it's not for aliens, it's for pollinators. So a star you will be if you plant a tree. This is not a joke, consider an oak, maple, willow, or choke, apple, plum, apple, plum, or cherry, or plant any bush of berry for hosting the young of our native species of butterflies, moths, and specialist beezies. So let's get down to the subject matter. There is a growing awareness of the need to plant native plants for pollinators. As we all know, there's a staggering reduction in pollinator insects, and it's caused by habitat loss and destruction, climate change, the use of pesticides, etc., monoculture or ag agriculture throughout the world, the nightlight that's killing our malls, and many more human interferences with nature. CBC very recently talked about the need even to hand pollinate in some cases that it looks like we're going to have to. One of the <clears throat> books that's influenced me was a, a book by Maya Lunde called The History of Bees in which the future scenario, futuristic scenario, um, is about a world towards the end of this century where in China, everything is hand pollinated. Uh, it's a very uh, tragic scenario. So this is the way I envisage the best of the best is uh, a place like Mer Bleu, where right here we're so fortunate. It's a Ramsar site, so it's uh, under the Convention of Wetlands. And I've discovered in some research and actually visiting that there are many such boardwalks protecting wetlands throughout Canada, and we need to protect more as well as our forests and so on. We all know this. This is where we, we have to go. What humans have done, <clears throat> particularly since the explorers, but even before then, is we've moved plants and animal species around the globe. Um, we've introduced by this exotics and exotic pests. Australia and New Zealand are well known for suffering the extreme effects, but we have it as well. So, I mean, I adore Kew Gardens and I've, I've read a bit about the botanists and Darwin and all the work they did to bring back species uh, so that we could all know what was going on, at least in Europe, what was going on in the world. And the Portuguese and other colonizers uh, actually moved plants from Portugal, for example, moved them from the Far East to Santao and Principe. They would settle them there and then they would move them to Portugal. So we have this movement all over the world. The silk producers in uh, New England, actually one silk producer brought Un unknowingly, the gypsy moth in. And so this is the type of thing that's happening, uh, has happened. And even today, uh, nurseries and uh, landscapers have introduced some very, very dangerous um, invasive, such as Phragmites australis, and well, even the common vinca spreads into the forest floors and it, it destroys all of the native uh, flora, which are essential for our native insects. This here, these pictures are from the Ringling Gardens in Sarasota, Florida. Just an example, the whole garden is full of this, of exotics. So they, this came, this Queensland, Queensland bottle tree, which I've seen in Queensland, is, borrow, is brought there from Australia. And we do this all the time, everywhere, even here. So Barry Keenan uh, is a, a very interesting uh, fellow just down in Maitland. Uh, Master Gardeners visited him uh, at, 
in a, on a tour this, this last weekend. And he has all kinds of trees. Um, it's a tree collection from which aren't native to here. He has coffee, Kentucky coffee trees. He has a monkey puzzle tree, etc. Now we saw bees on some of the blossoms. So it, it, we can't say it doesn't attract the bees, but we don't know if many of the native pollinators are actually uh, able to eat these trees or pollinate these trees. Um, they may or they may not. This is a native, uh, these are some native trees. I believe this was the service berry. I was actually um, choosing one for my sister's garden. This is at Green Thumb off of Maryville, but you must ask for native. So what can we do as people about these issues? Well, we can protest and fund environmental advocacy. We can write our representatives, we can vote, but can we do anything individually? This, of course, is that uh, big rally for the environment on September 19th of 2019, held here in Ottawa. Very big riot, big uh, protest. So we can become informed. This is from the fall of 2019. This is my daughter, Alexis. And um, we had a couple of common wheat that came into the garden. And oh, I thought, oh, great, I'm going to have a monarch way station. This is fantastic. I didn't even know at the time that this was the monarch caterpillar. I thought, oh, this is a beautiful little caterpillar that settled on her arm. Um, <clears throat> I still can't identify many caterpillars, but I know now that they're absolutely the essential element to our food web. And we got, we, we received much of this information from many, many lectures during COVID particularly. But my, my most, um, the most eloquent I find is Doug Tallamy's work. It's, uh, it's on YouTube and he has three fantastic books, but Nature's Best Hope, Bringing Nature Home and The Nature of Oaks, which is, he's just written. And I've been reading and it's the rich ecology of our most essential native trees. <clears throat> and so we gardeners can make a difference. We have, had, we have had and we continue to have many excellent presentations by master gardeners on our Trial Talk Live and other horticulture organizations do lectures. We, um, we have scientists and environmentalists. They're all saying pretty much the same thing now. Cut your pesticides, herbicides, fungicides, go natural. Use compost, manure, permaculture. Reduce your lawn size. Doug Tallamy is very much into this. Plant gardens instead. Don't disturb the soil because you need the mycelium to stay connected under the soil. Leave some uncovered as homes for ground bees. Cut your night light. If you have to have night light, uh, make it yellow because the moths are dying. Avoid exotics and especially invasive plants, which I was talking about before. Diversify your plants and plant for flowering throughout the season to provide food for many different insects and provide swaths of these uh, particular plants, the good ones, because the natives, because then they'll know where to find them. Be a lazy gardener. Leave your standing plants in the winter. Let leaves become mulch. No more may we've all heard about. Water should be available for butterflies. And plant native plants with symbiotic relationships with native insects and wildlife developed over millennia. And that's the point, is it develops together over millennia. Some plants have a singular role, such as milkweed, which seems to be, be the source of uh, food for only the monarch. Others are essential to hundreds of species. Uh, honeybees can, can use all different species, uh, all different plants, whereas specialist bees can only sometimes use one. And now we know about keystone plant genera. So choose them if you can. And that's what I'm coming to next. So you can gradually introduce native plants and they attract the pollinators. I even did a little bit of research on the ladybug and they are actually excellent pollinators and they eat uh, aphids, which is great. And then just as an example, I got some anise hyssop from one of our fellow um, master gardeners, Julianne Labreche. It's And this is just its uh, first year and it was already spectacular and it attracted all kinds of bees for at least a month or two. But the newest information that I think isn't yet widely known is about these keystone plant genera. And this map, and there, I've got a more detailed one later on, is the map of the ecoregions of um, 
North America. Canada sits, or Ottawa sits, at the juncture of eight, which is the eastern temperate force going all the way down in the side of the United States, and northern force, which is all the north. Doug Tallamy's team of an Lepidoptera researchers, so he is an entomologist, and moths and butterflies are his specialty. <clears throat> at the University of Delaware, they found, by uh, actually counting and observing all kinds of plants that a very few genus support the vast majority of caterpillars and specialist bees. Specialist bees were studied by other teams. Caterpillars are his specialty. 14% of native plants support 90% 90, 90 of the butterfly and moth species in North America. So I have handouts which uh, you can get and that those are really important because they show our two regions and they sh and there's one by Doug Tallamy's team and they're not all exactly the same in terms of numbers but they all have the same order that uh, a little bit varied. Um, I mean basically when you look at these this list of I've done 30 uh, of the top they're mainly trees Oak being by far the most important, plum, birch, poplar, maple, crabapple, hickory, alder, pine. And then you get into some of the bushes, blueberry, currant, blackberry, raspberry. And then you get into some of the perennials like goldenrods and asters and sunflowers. And this is the list from several of these lists that list the top 30 in descending order. And all of these are host to more than a hundred varieties of caterpillars or specialist bees. Um, many host, um, they, they, they may host the same ones or different species and some, as I mentioned, will host only one. So um, <clears throat> what can we do? So in the left, uh, I, I, this is sort of my garden uh, in about two, 2016, I started, um, I left my borders and I started incorporating uh, an organic vegetable garden. Uh, my husband built me three gardens and I thought I would become a great organic gardener and feed the food bank. There's never a great success to that at all, but we still have vegetables growing. Last year, I started switching up into some more native sections and I have a little, little um, bog garden created uh, with Robert Pavlis's simple idea of, of you, you just um, buy one of those peat, peat, peat blocks and you cut it open and you make a bog garden, which I did. And I put seeds and I ended up with just an amazing collection of wildflowers and borage. The giant blue nobilia, actually, I received that. I got that from Edith Falconer and it has just grown exponentially. It's phenomenal. Now I'm separating it and I've put it in other gardens and I'm giving it away. So <clears throat> what the other thing I think is important to do is, is you basically just look at your own garden and your environment, which I've done uh, minimally, but I've looked around and I've seen that I have, in fact, many, many, many trees, shrubs, uh, in the in the forest, uh, there's just just tons of these various keystone or or lesser lesser value. Uh, for example, like the ginkgo, it's a, not a native, but it does host five. And so I've I've decided to sort of not switch everything, but to look at what is valuable and what isn't. And even when you add these all up, for example, this little guy here behind this planter is an eastern white pine. It's about 15 years old. It should be about, I don't know, 20, 30 feet tall, but it's a dwarf. So even in a, a relatively small garden, I know mine's bigger than most uh, gardens in the inner city, it, I have lots of different shrubs and, uh, and I have some miniatures which, which can help because they do the same, they, they do the same thing. Um, I decided to leave the borders. Um, I had some fruit trees, of course, they're valuable. I happen to have planted Echinacea globe thistle, Canada anemone, which you just can't stop from spreading, lupin, black-eyed Susans, etc. And those are very valuable in small ways. So I keep those, of course. And then when I have space, so I started converting some of these vegetable gardens into 
native gardens. And this is one year after the tiniest little slips went in. And I got them from Fletcher Wildlife Center, from some master gardeners, from the seed library, and from some nurseries. And now I have, oh my goodness, I have just amazing tall asters. They're now about four or five feet tall, goldenrod, joe pie weed. They're gentian. They're not yet in flower, most of them. Uh, these are the penstemon, but they will be in flower, uh, especially in the fall when these pollinators need uh, lots of uh, fl flowering bushes and so on. And, you know, Amsonia has been in flower this week, last week. Uh, we will have, I will have lots of color. Right now I have just varieties of green. It looks like a mess when you look at it here, but when you actually stand there, I have them labeled and I have some distinction around them. So um, I, 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 we should just talk about the oak for a minute because the oak is without a doubt the absolutely most important um, tree genus in all of North America and possibly the world. So this is a little tiny one from Marianne Vanderloo's garden this weekend. Uh, she had last year was a bumper crop of oak, so she has to pull out tons of seedlings, which didn't get eaten. Oaks get eaten by everything, and are sim they have a symbiotic relationship with blue jays. Blue jays have adapted to be able to to plant and then cut open these oaks. So then I planted it, and then um, so I'll plant that somewhere, and this dreadful looking mess is actually behind me there's a forest behind me and i put an oak tree in here that's about three years old four years old maybe that had been uh, something that came into our garden so i let it grow you have to protect them you have to protect them from the animals for sure uh rodents and stuff with fencing and, and rabbits at the beginning uh, and in the first year, actually, you, you, you really have to protect the seeds because the seeds uh, can be eaten by, by anything. Very few oaks survive, actually, of the thousands and millions of seedlings. And we've just cut a tiny bit. I mean, it's right behind our house, so it's, and it's a, quite a big woods. So we've just made sure there's some light for it. This is my mother-in-law's um, memorial tree. Uh, as it happens, my husband um, chose three oaks for his brother, mother, and father that are on the Royal Ottawa Golf Club. So you can you can plant oaks in different ways. Three minutes. Oh, I'm down to three minutes. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you. So where can we find native plants? Well, um, in uh, Loblaws, they have an in the zone labeling, but I can't find it this year. They don't know if they're going to get it in. And then there are native plant, there's native plant labeling in some other places, but ask your nurseries to stock native plants. We really have to do that. And um, here are some native only nurseries. I have been to Beaux Arbres Plantes Indigenes in Bristol, Quebec, and it's fabulous. I don't know Naturescaping or Corner Pollinator Garden. The Ottawa Wildflower Seed Library is incredibly helpful. Fletcher Wildlife Garden, I don't think they're doing a sale this year, or if they have, I've missed it. I bought mine online last year, um, but that's another possibility. And please come to our Saturday Monarch Day where uh, master gardeners are bringing some native plants for sale as part of this uh, wonderful day for families. That's on Saturday at Kitchissippi United Church from 10 to 3. Um, we have handouts. Uh, I have handouts that I mentioned, and I would strongly recommend that you, you, you get those and print them and have a look at your own garden and see, and see what, you, what you think you have and what you might be wanting to put there. And then this is the more detailed map I was mentioning of the ecological regions of North America, which I found online under ecological regions of North America, keystone plants. And I went in and I found this. And uh, I'm asking now, do you have any questions? And uh, just this last photo is just this couple of days ago at the experiment, I guess last weekend, at the Central Experimental Farm. It's a white oak. Uh, and as I said, the peonies are in full bloom, head on down. We have lots of different oaks in the arboretum as well. So, any yeah, questions? So, thanks, Adair. Uh, at the moment, we don't, but I, I have a couple myself coming from an urban uh, small garden. Um, and my question would be, and I'm hoping it would be helpful to others, is that 
in a small garden, is it possible for me to plant an oak? Is there a gen type of oak that would be suitable? I think of an oak as an enormous tree. Yeah, yeah. Um, but if we want to get more of them, can we scale it down? And, and sec secondary would be maybe your top three, like the top tree would be oak, the top um, uh, perennial, uh, perennial would be maybe golden rub, but top three for a smaller urban garden that would really help to promote the right. pollinators, lots oak, of caterpillars. Sure, absolutely. Oak, oak are not, as, as far as I know, miniaturized. <clears throat> I was wondering about bonsaiing an oak and trying to keep it small. I uh, haven't done that. But um, they do take a long time to grow, like the first few years. Uh, like the one that I showed you is about 15, 20 years old, no, 15 years old, the one that is at the golf club. Um, <clears throat> there is a there is a varietal that Doug Ptolemy talks about in his lecture, Palmyris, I think it's called, but I don't think it's, it's one we can grow here. It's a miniature, miniature oak. I mean, it, it grows along the ground. It's a strange oak from our perspective. So oak is, in a small garden is probably uh, out of the question. However, Prunus, which is uh, on my list, 456, you know, oak is 557, Prunus is 456 in terms of the number of caterpillars it supports. Well, there you have plum trees and cherry trees, um, <clears throat> sand cherries. They're small. Um, down the line, you can get to dogwood. Yeah, it's not as many, but it definitely supports. And you know, pagoda dogwood is a lovely native that uh, is an understory tree. Um, serviceberry. Serviceberry is an excellent one. It's, it's down the line a bit in terms of the number of, but, but if you add it all up, it's not a problem, you know, and then bushes, you can do these black currant bushes. I have three bushes and they don't take up much room at all. And, and we get lots of fruit. Um, and I'm looking at my lists here, but even rhododendron, I know it's not so typical of here, but I have a couple of rhododendron that are attracting a lot and they don't get very big. So if you take a look at these lists and look at your own garden and then think, oh, okay, now in terms of, in terms of, um, Oh, there, can I just ask about pyramid oaks? There's been a question for oh, one. Pyramid, uh, a pyramid oak, yes. Oh, sorry. <laughs> we have a lot of columnar oaks in our neighborhood. Um, and they're along the side of condominiums. Yes, you're quite right. Excuse me. Pyramid or columnar oak. And yes, they get tall, but they stay very skinny. And a okay. uh, neighbor of my mother, she put about four or five along the back of her uh, swimming pool few years ago and they're just beautiful so that is one that we can grow here uh, I should have mentioned that and then when you come to flowering plants without a doubt you know goldenrod aster and sunflower are the top but you know you can have some black-eyed susans you can have some uh, smaller um, I'm just trying to think of some of the smaller ones that are uh, prairie clover you know ironwood fleabane um, Many, many that are just, they're not as big. Uh, coneflowers, coneflowers are excellent. Okay. Thank you. Any questions? I don't, there are no more questions on the chat. Um, but if you think of a question later on, mm -hmm. uh, you can send an email to our, our helpline um, and uh, we'll probably be able to give you some answers there. Okay. Yeah, okay, I'm just uh, wondering if I can elaborate on anything. Uh, in terms of invasives, we do have uh, a number of um, uh, Trail Talk Live and Trail Talk written articles on invasives and what to be aware of uh, not planting. So uh, I guess the point being to, to be a little bit cautious when you are even buying from a nursery because they're not labeling, they should, but they're not labeling things as invasives. And some of these grasses like Phragmites, um, well, should never, ever, ever be sown. They have to be taken out. Str uh, you know, dog strangling vine, of course, nobody I think would ever plant, but if you get it in your garden, you have to take it out. I know Barbara, you did something recently on that and how to, uh, how to uh, safely extract this. Exotics, I think the thing is that We've, we've always been told or we thought as gardeners that the garden had to be full of color and had to be 
more, the more exotic, the better, you know, like the peonies, you have all these double, triple uh, flowering uh, peonies. But the point is that the pollinators cannot actually use those. The singles, the single flowers and the simpler, more basic natives are actually what our insects need. And so we have to stop thinking that only color is what we want. We also want perhaps a little less color, but more important food source. Um, Adair, there's a question here about a Norway maple. Yes. Um, yeah. And the listener is asking about a very large one in her front yard that was inherited with the home. So what would your thoughts be on taking it down? Yes, sadly, it's a very, uh, it's a very bad tree uh, for us. We shouldn't have, they shouldn't have planted so many. I might even be the city that put it there. They, she could ask the city if it's on their property to consider removing it and putting in something um, that won't, for example, it's surprising it didn't even break in the windstorm because they're very weak trees. They're a weed and we shouldn't have them. We should have Canadian silver maple, uh, you know, now that's a very big tree. I have two beautiful maples in the back. Um, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You said Norway maple. I'm sorry. I have a Norway maple and that's fine. It's not, it's not, it's not um, as weak as a Manitoba maple. I'm sorry. I thought you said Manitoba maple. No, Norway, Norway maple is okay. You can leave it and it's lovely and it's brownish. Uh, it maybe isn't as good as the native maple for uh, attracting pollinators. But on the other hand, if it's there and it's a tree and it's a canopy, don't take it down. But it is weaker than our own maples. Uh, it was the Manitoba maple that's a weed, I'm sorry. Uh, Adair, yes. can I just jump in here and ask you to scroll back to your handout slide? Yes. So people might need a little bit more time to read that instruction. Yes, here we are. <clears throat> Yes, so you scroll back in the chat and there's one, there's a link to the handout. Um, and on iPads, apparently it doesn't always show up. So you can ask for a copy at mgoc.ttl, live at gmail.com. And, um, and there are, this is recorded as they all are for YouTube. So again, people can ask for, um, for it at our website, mgoc.ttl at gmail.com. Yes. So there are no more questions here, Adair. Um, well, if, if I could just ask one, we have about two minutes left. Um, could you speak a little bit to that map, which I find really interesting? You say yes. we're, we're really on the boundary there. Yes. Are there different keystone species for each of those that you yes. know of? Uh, yes, yes. That's why I've added the charts. Uh, and that's why I wrote down from the three different charts. So we have, we're on the cusp of, I'm afraid, uh, move this over so I can actually I can't actually show you on my map because um because uh it's covered but Ottawa is exactly on the border of the northern forests and the eastern temperate so some of these um trees that they mention in eastern temperate uh are really butternut hickory has a little trouble growing here pig nut hickory mocker nut hickory but we can grow some hickories um, Virginia pine, we don't grow here, but we grow pitch pine and eastern white pine. Whereas in the other one, the northern one, you will see slightly different varieties of these plant genus, the main plant genus. But everybody says you can grow crab apples. And those are, oh, that's another small tree that is very, very valuable, the malus. Um, so this is when you take the different charts and put them together and look at them. These are the top 30 um, um, species that support or trees or plants that support our caterpillars and often our, our bees, our specialist bees. But okay. the charts are very useful because they show you which support caterpillars, which support pollen, um, pollinating bees. 
Was thank that you. okay, Mary? Did yes, you... that's great. Thank yeah. you so much, Adair. You know, your passion is real for this subject is truly inspiring. Thank and you. I just want to thank you for this presentation. Thank you, Barbara, for making sure the questions were all addressed. Thanks to all of you for attending and participating. Please be sure to tune in next week when the topic will be Big Ideas for Small Gardens with Andrea Knight. And with that, bid you, you farewell. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day.